Hi, and welcome back to the Learning Stethoscope. Today we're talking about asthma, a very common condition that affects the airways. To really understand asthma, let's first look at what the airways normally look like in a healthy person. Imagine a cross-section of the airway. In the center, we see the open lumen, which is the passage for air. Then, lining the lumen, there's a thin layer of mucus that helps trap dust and microbes, keeping the airway protected. Beneath that, we have the epithelial cells, then the supportive layer called the lamina propria, and finally the smooth muscle, which is usually relaxed. This relaxed muscle keeps the airway wide open, allowing air to flow in and out freely without resistance. Now, in asthma, the airways go through a series of changes that make breathing much more difficult. The key problem is that the airways become overly sensitive, or what we call hyperreactive. This means that when they're exposed to triggers like pollen, cold air, or even exercise, they overreact and become inflamed. So let's zoom in and take a closer look at the epithelial lining of the airways to see how this happens. Asthma attacks often begin with the first exposure to an allergen or a trigger, such as pollen or dust mite particles. These particles are captured by antigen-presenting cells or dendritic cells present in the airway lining. The dendritic cells then carry the allergens to nearby lymph nodes, where they present them to naive T cells, activating them and leading to their transformation into T2 helper cells. These T2 helper cells then orchestrate the immune response by releasing several cytokines. They release interleukin 4 and 13 which then promote B cells to transform into plasma cells that produce allergen-specific IgE antibodies. These antibodies then attach to mast cells, leading to the release of several granules containing histamine, leukotrienes, and prostaglandins, which ultimately lead to inflammation. The T helper cells also release interleukin-5, which recruits and activates eosinophils. Once activated, these eosinophils release cytokines and additional inflammatory mediators, amplifying the inflammation. Now, both these pathways lead to three main changes in the airways that are important to know. First is inflammation. Immune cells flood into the airway lining, causing swelling of the tissues and making them hypersensitive to even minor irritations. Second is bronchoconstriction. The smooth muscle that surrounds the airways contracts, narrowing the passage and reducing airflow. And finally, there's increased mucus secretion. Inflammatory mediators stimulate the glands to produce thick, sticky mucus, which can further block the airway. Together, these changes make it much harder to breathe. The good news is that in the early stages, these airway changes are completely reversible. They usually occur only during asthma attacks, and between attacks, the airways can return to normal. But if asthma attacks keep happening over months or years, the repeated inflammation can lead to irreversible structural changes, a process called airway remodeling. This includes thickening of the basement membrane, hypertrophy of smooth muscle, goblet cell hyperplasia, and even new blood vessel formation in the airway wall, which allows more inflammatory cells to enter. Over time, these structural changes make the airways permanently narrower and more reactive even when there's no active attack. That's why early and consistent treatment is so important. Asthma attacks don't happen out of nowhere. They are usually set off by specific triggers. These triggers can vary widely between individuals, but there are some common ones that can provoke asthma attacks. Allergens, like dust mites, pollen, mold, or even pet dander. Irritants, such as cigarette smoke, air pollution, or strong chemical fumes. Exercise, especially in cold, dry air, which can dry and cool the airway lining. Respiratory infections, particularly viral colds, which make the airways more sensitive. Medications, like NSAIDs or beta blockers, which can trigger symptoms in susceptible individuals. Other factors, even stress or strong emotions, which can change breathing patterns and airway tone. No matter the trigger, the result is the same. An overreaction of the airways leading to inflammation, narrowing, and difficulty breathing. Now, the exact cause of asthma is unknown, 
but it's believed to be a combination of genetic predisposition and environmental factors. Certain genes influence immune responses, and having a family history of asthma increases the risk. Regarding environmental factors, exposure to allergens, air pollution, and respiratory infections early in life can increase the risk of developing asthma, especially in people who are genetically predisposed. One popular explanation is the hygiene hypothesis. The hygiene hypothesis suggests that during early childhood, reduced exposure to infectious agents and microorganisms may impair the normal development of the immune system, ultimately increasing the risk of asthma and other allergic diseases. This basically means that growing up in an excessively clean environment makes the immune system more likely to overreact to harmless substances later in life. During an asthma episode, patients may experience dyspnea, meaning shortness of breath, wheezing during exhalation, experience chest tightness, or a persistent cough that often worsens at night or in the early morning. Some attacks are mild and resolve quickly, while others can be severe and even life-threatening, requiring immediate medical treatment. Diagnosing asthma involves combining the patient's symptoms, which we've just discussed, with pulmonary function tests. We usually start by suspecting asthma based on the symptoms, things like wheezing, shortness of breath, chest tightness, and cough. But to confirm the diagnosis, we need to perform a spirometry test. In spirometry, the patient blows into a device that measures how much air they can exhale and how quickly. From this test, we get several important values. The most important one is the FEV1, the forced expiratory volume in one second, meaning how much air the patient can exhale in the first second of the maneuver. In asthma, the FEV1 is usually reduced, reflecting airway narrowing. Another key value is the FVC, or forced vital capacity, which is the total amount of air a person can exhale after a deep breath. By comparing these two values, we calculate the FEV1 to FVC ratio, which in asthma is typically decreased. Now, the hallmark of asthma is reversibility. To test this, the patient inhales a bronchodilator such as salbutamol, and then the spirometry is repeated. If the FEV1 improves by at least 12% or 200 milliliters from baseline, this strongly supports the diagnosis of asthma. So, in summary, asthma is diagnosed by combining characteristic symptoms, evidence of variable airflow limitation on spirometry, and reversibility after bronchodilation. The treatment of asthma has two main goals. First is to control symptoms, and second is to prevent future attacks. So, management depends on both relieving acute symptoms and maintaining long-term control of airway inflammation. First, let's look at the medications used in quick relief. These are called reliever medications, and the most common are short-acting beta-2 agonists, such as salbutamol. They work by relaxing the smooth muscles around the airways, rapidly reversing bronchoconstriction and easing symptoms like shortness of breath and wheezing. However, they only treat the symptom, not the underlying inflammation. That's why long-term management always requires controller medications. The cornerstone here is daily corticosteroids. These drugs reduce airway inflammation, decrease hyperreactivity, and lower the risk of severe attacks. For patients with more frequent symptoms, long-acting beta agonists are often combined with inhaled corticosteroids to provide both anti-inflammatory and sustained bronchodilator effects. Other medications include leukotriene receptor antagonists, like Montelukast. Besides medication, trigger avoidance is essential. This means reducing exposure to allergens, quitting smoking, controlling environmental irritants, and treating comorbidities. It's important to note that treatment follows a stepwise approach. This means that therapy is adjusted up or down depending on how well symptoms are controlled. Finally, patient education plays a critical role. Patients should understand how to use their inhalers correctly, recognize early warning signs of an attack, and have a personalized asthma action plan. And that's it. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to support the The Learning Stethoscope. Let me know in the comments what topics you'd like me to cover next. Stay curious, and I'll see you in the next video.